Aloha listeners, thank you so much for tuning in to today's Just Position episode. Before we get into the episode, though, I just wanted to make a quick statement. I'm really excited about this episode because it covers topics that I think we really need to be discussing and th- topics that more of us need to be educated on, but they are sensitive in nature. So I wanted to issue a sensitive content warning. A lot of the topics we're discussing are related to the opioid epidemic, the overdose crisis um, that the world is currently experiencing. Uh, substance abuse, drug addiction, and other sensitive topics in nature. So if you are a parent and you hear my voice coming from your child's iPad, this would be a better conversation to have with them in person. Um, But for anyone else, I really encourage you to listen to this episode because it is very important that we talk about these things. And I think it's something we all need to be more educated about. So without further ado, let's start the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Just a Physician, the podcast where we explore mental health, vulnerability, and personal life journeys. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already and listen to new episodes out every Thursday. I'm really looking forward to this episode because it's a little bit of a change of pace, a little bit of a change of topic. Um, This is something that I think is really important to be discussed about and just to be talked about. And unfortunately, it is becoming something more and more relevant, but a discussion that we really need to have. And I'm super excited to have Andrew on from Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. Um, Basically, well, you'll be able to see what the full topic is and all the topics that we're going to be exploring. But I first want you to introduce yourself and what you do with HHRC. And thank you so much again for coming out. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. We're super excited to be a part of this. Um, My name is Andrew. Um, I'm the Development Director and Marketing at Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. So we are a Harm Reduction Agency, um, we were founded in the early 80s as a response to the HIV epidemic Mm -hmm. um, under a different name, but we've been doing the work for the past 40 years. We actually celebrate 40 years this year. Um, We still continue to work with people living with HIV, but what we've done is we've really expanded services to really try to treat all the other things that were affecting people. And so we also work with the unsheltered community, um, the drug using community. Mm-hmm. Um, we provide behavioral health, mental health services, um, the trans community, mm-hmm. and as well as smoking cessation. That's super cool. I mean, I didn't realize you guys have been open for 40 years. That's a really long time, but it's cool that it was inspired, you know, as a response to the um, HIV epidemic that was prevalent in the 80s. I mean, even in preparation for this video, I'm obviously familiar with HHRC and some of the services you provide. I didn't realize how many you provide, like all the things that you mentioned, because I really was only familiar with it from, uh, you know, uh, transition support um, resource center, as well as, of course, um, anyone who is uh, active drug users or an active addiction. Um, but like, yeah, kind of go go into more depth as to like the kind of services you guys provide because it's really like turnkey. You, you do a lot. Yes, um, 28 different programs we have wow. um, within our agency. And like I said, what we tried to do is what we started with our core, right? Which was people living with HIV. Mm-hmm. And we tried to look at what was affecting these people. Mm-hmm. And we found that housing stability was affecting them. So we started working with the unsheltered community. So we provide... Um, um, houseless outreach services for half of the island of Oahu. Wow, that's um, so cool. Then we looked at behavioral health, mental health. Um, we saw that that was also affecting people living with HIV. So then we branched off into that. And so we have a certified substance abuse counselor as well as a nice. DO on staff that works, that specializes in addiction medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, then everything else just kind of falls in line with that. But um, we run a statewide syringe exchange program as well. Mm-hmm. Um, which we exchange here in Hawaii approximately 1.2 million needles a wow. year. Wow. So we're one okay. for one. People bring us a used needle and we will give them a brand new one. Mm-hmm. Um, several different reasons for this. Like it keeps people from like tossing it on the ground mm-hmm. where a dog or a child can step on it. Yeah. And so it creates accountability like that. And so they bring it back to us and we provide them with um, a safe brand new needle to use and so people aren't Mm -hmm. sharing needles as well which helps prevent the spread of diseases like HIV or hep C and things like that so Mm -hmm. that is really impactful that is so cool I mean I've looked up to HHRC for a long time ever since I first started learning about the first services you offered which we'll get into a little bit later in the episode but um, uh, I knew a few people who worked there and then I obviously then knew you worked there and then um, I 
saw that you guys like uh, were starting to give out Narcan to people, which I thought was really, really cool. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. But I think the work that you do is really incredible because it is about, you know, supporting people who may fall under certain kind of like stigmatized categories, which I think is really, really unfortunate. And um, I know from what I've been able to see, there is kind of a stigma that is prevalent among people who say maybe an active addiction, struggle with substance abuse or active drug users. I mean, and I think for that reason, a lot of times the types of services that you guys provide are have been in the past more difficult to find. But I think it's incredible that the work that you are doing is so impactful. I mean, 1.2 million needles, that is incredible. Um, I, I, I think it's really cool. I mean, would you agree that you think a stigma in the past or currently has existed? And why do you think it may not be beneficial for people to, you know, might maybe when it comes to these topics, be a little bit like, oh, clutch the pearls, you yeah. know, type of thing? <laughs> no, definitely. Even when I go out into the community and talk about it, there's always like a certain stigma or shame around like talking about these subjects. But, you know, like it's the stigma that a lot of times will kill people. Yes. Um, I think we saw that with the HIV epidemic in like the early years, people were so ashamed and stigmatized by like going and getting tested, talking about their HIV status with their partners, um, mm-hmm. talking about it with their doctors that they literally were dying from the stigma and the shame. And we're finding the same thing with um, the people that use drugs, you know, like we want to, we don't, we want to support them and making their decisions. And that's why everything we do comes from that harm reduction lens, Mm -hmm. you know, like where any positive change is a positive change. So Mm -hmm. if someone comes into us, to our offices and tells us that they normally use 12 times a week and last Mm -hmm. week they only used eight, you know, we'll celebrate that with them, you know, like any positive change. We like to go out there, we meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. Uh, We go out into the streets. We have a very robust outreach team. So we go out into the streets, we go out into the bushes, like anywhere Mm -hmm. people are, we will go out there and meet them and try to provide as many services as possible. That is so cool. I absolutely love that approach because like, and I talk a lot about mental health on this podcast. I've talked about like, I think in my opinion, the most damaging aspect of um, anyone who struggles with uh, something and related to mental health is the shame and the guilt mm-hmm. and the secrecy around it. That's what does the most damage. And just by be, being able to be open about it, you're able to move forward and improve so much. And the fact that you guys want to celebrate like any success, no matter what that looks like, because maybe decreasing from 12 times to eight times in a week may not seem like a big deal to the average person, but to that person, that is a huge improvement. And that is definitely like something that should be celebrated. Mm -hmm. I I think it's awesome. Um, I know that some people like listening to this or some people when kind of hearing about these topics may be like, what, you know, using drugs, using like abstinence only, you shouldn't use drugs at all. Like that's a no, no, like why? And I know there is some controversy around harm reduction overall Mm -hmm. because abstinence only drug education, for example, which is kind of where I want to focus the conversation in this episode. Um, Abstinence only has been something that has been taught literally since we were kids and the dare progress and stuff, you know, like what do you think that abstinence only education is harmful and why? Um, I think that good science based education is what's needed. Mm -hmm. You know, like abstinence only is just unrealistic in most cases. Mm -hmm. I think it's unrealistic for a lot of the people that um, are using drugs or that suffer from this form of addiction, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's unrealistic and it's just setting them up to fail. And then when they fail, it, it's just, imagine what that does to your mental health, you know, Mm -hmm. like knowing that you've relapsed or anything like that, or you started using again, like abstinence only is definitely not an approach that we try to take. So Mm -hmm. Harm reduction definitely has been proven in many, many different arenas to be a much more successful approach and really just uh, acknowledging people's self-determination to make their own choices in life. Yep. Meet them where they're at. Because, yeah, I mean, and obviously I I will say, like, I haven't been in active, like, drug addiction personally. However, like, I know people who have been um and if you are listening and you think that like oh my gosh well no one i know does drugs that's ridiculous someone you know (laughs) if it's not you someone you know is definitely using drugs and i think i agree with you abstinence only education is not productive because um you know some people i think are able to go like quit cold turkey and Mm -hmm. see success in that but recovery is so different for every individual person and even you know 
I, there's just so many people who use some sort of substance and I think it's unrealistic to view the world through a scope of like just don't do drugs like just don't do it because I'm like that is actively ignoring <laughs> so many people if not most people um, who you know do participate and I, I think it's a very unhealthy black and white thinking I don't know if you know definitely and there's so many different types what drug use looks so different to every person you know mm -hmm. there is those that use recreational and mm -hmm. then <clears throat> It's also acknowledging that some people use drugs to cope as a coping mechanism, you know, mm -hmm. for historical trauma, things that have happened to them in the past, yep. things that they grew up with, you know, like mm -hmm. they can be, it could, recovery can look unique to every person, so mm -hmm. can drug use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it's so important that we talk about it too, because like one of the challenges I've seen with like abstinence only conversations and say like the dare approach that you know we went through is that it really erases the important and necessary conversations that need to be had around drug use it's very it creates kind of a stigma where it's like oh, shh, don't talk about that that's like shameful oh that's dirty and not only is that not productive um at all and not true to reality i think in my opinion it's also completely erasing like so many people who may be you know in active addiction who might be struggling and it really just erases I think their stories and their needs one of the main reasons I have wanted to like have this conversation like bring you on is just because I have been paying I've been seeing like a lot on TikTok across social media news channels just kind of the explosion of um, overdoses um, fatalities from <clears throat> drug use that have really just been everywhere it really has truly turned into like an epidemic i mean there's the opioid epidemic obviously but then there's also like the introduction of fentanyl and mm -hmm. now it's in every single city in every single state and it's mind-blowing to me how many tiktoks i see from families who lost their child due to like a fentanyl overdose and even what's more mind-blowing is like i look at these tiktoks and i'll see hundreds of comments and every single comment is like i lost my son i lost both my children i lost my parents i lost my nephew like the amount of overdoses happening in the us usa is just absolutely insane and i think a you know it's if we're not having these conversations then like what you were saying before like the stigma and the shame leads to death, you know? And we're at a point in time where it's like, we need to be talking about this. And obviously you work in this space, which is absolutely incredible. But, you know, for people who might not be as familiar to kind of these conversations and kind of what's happening right now, like tell us like, what is fentanyl? What are you seeing with kind of like the um, opioid crisis and um, overdoses um, currently right now? Well, I think you hit it the nail right on the head. You know, these conversations need to be happening. And mm -hmm. I mean, we saw that with earlier sex education, right? Like mm -hmm. telling kids don't have sex. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it doesn't work. And yeah. then you end up with all of these children that don't know how to use com condoms and yep. end up with teen pregnancies and everything else, you know? So like mm -hmm. we know that abstinence and just sticking our head in the sand and not pretending like it's not happening is never going to work. Mm -hmm. But um, so fentanyl, so what we're seeing is we're seeing fentanyl in so many different types of drugs that it wouldn't normally appear in normally, mm -hmm. right? So fentanyl is an opioid. It is a synthetic opioid that's about 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine. Mm -hmm. And basically like a grain of sand can kill you. Yeah. And so, but what we're finding is that it's being cross-contaminated in drug labs with all of these other substances that wouldn't normally contain an opioid. So something like someone might be, it's, it's street drugs, right? So mm -hmm. people are buying cocaine and thinking that they're getting cocaine when it might be laced with fentanyl. And then they might be partying with their friends one weekend. And if no one has Narcan on them or in naloxone, like... Mm -hmm. They could, they could be at a risk for overdose. And so that's something that, you know, we're seeing this all across the country. And mm -hmm. it's it's really crazy. And so there's so many, we try to encourage people as much as possible to really educate themselves about everything. Never use alone. Um, we encourage people that are using substances to go slow and start low. Mm -hmm. um, your body can change. The drugs can change. You know, like you never know. Like you may have been using drugs for the past 10 years and you might just pick up a bad batch mm -hmm. and that could be the end of your life. Mm -hmm. So we always encourage people that are going to be using substances to never use alone mm -hmm. and just really start slow and have Narcan on hand. Yeah, I love that. And I, I want to get a little bit into Narcan. But yeah, thank you for explaining that. Because for anyone who's not familiar with fentanyl, I highly, highly recommend you look up 
what it is, learn more about it. There's a lot of great documentaries I've watched about it, um, news stories that are really informative. But it is, it's just crazy because as opposed to kind of in the past where usually it, with substances, what you get is what you get. If you are, you know, say a light drug user who only, you know, maybe like smokes some weed and occasionally does some um, coke, whereas uh, relatively in the past it was safe. Now, um, people who are first time using a drug are experiencing overdoses because of laced fentanyl in um, in the substances that they're using, which is just absolutely mind blowing. Like the amount of stories I've seen of like 13 year olds, 14 year olds who are dying from their first use is wild. And you were saying like it's gone into so many other substances beyond like what maybe people would consider a fentanyl user to be like mm-hmm. like heroin or meth or, or any other substance um it's now just showing up in everything which is why i'm like everyone should know about it every parent should know about it and it's just the importance of it do you think there's um what what do you think are kind of the ways to best f- for anyone who might be using any substances what are ways to kind of like look out for fentanyl or is it really just like you really don't know um well fentanyl test strips are great mm-hmm. um Fentanyl test strips. There's other um, kind of test kits that are available from different nonprofits um, that are available online. Um, currently, um, in the state of Hawaii, unfortunately, fentanyl test strips are actually considered drug paraphernalia. So we are actually working um, really? with we are actually working with the state legislature this year to try to get fentanyl test strips decriminalized so that wow. we can advocate to openly give out fentanyl test strips to anyone that needs it, so that people are able to test their drugs. Wow, that is incredible. That's obviously such impactful work. That's amazing. I literally had no idea they were illegal, which is mind blowing to me that test strips for a substance that, you know, can literally like change lives would not be legal. Yes. It's just, it's, I think it's just <laughs> evident of the amount of work that we have to do and the importance of the work that you guys are doing. Because um, I also wanted to talk to you about like, um, well, first of all, for everyone who it does use um, or anyone you know who might use, always recommend testing. Like that's so, so important. It's, it's something that's pretty easily done, but definitely important to make sure that first off doesn't show up. But I also want to talk about Narcan or Naloxone. Mm. Um, So can you describe what uh, Naloxone is? Um, Yeah. So Naloxone is a drug that um, when administered can actually block the opioid receptors from taking hold and causing overdose. So the way that um, opioid overdose works is that it basically stops you from breathing. It's Mm -hmm. shallow. It slows you down so much that you basically stop breathing. Mm -hmm. And so the form of the nasal form of naloxone is called Narcan, mm-hmm. which um, you'll see all over the all over the internet, social media, and it is administered through the nose, like similar to like Flonies. Mm-hmm. You just kind of like spritz it in the nose, wait three or five minutes, and then do a second dose in the other nostril. Mm-hmm. Um, it's readily available um, all across the country. Um, a really great resource is Next Distro, N E X T D I. Stro.org. So they um, are a nationwide organization that tracks like in every state where you can get free Noxone and Narcan. Oh wow! And that's so you great. can go to that their website nextistro.org, and they will um, they'll help you find Narcan in your er- local area. And so for the state of Hawaii, we are the statewide distributor. So we train all of the police departments, the fire departments, paramedics. Um, we provide Naloxone for everyone. Um, you can go to our website if you live in the state of Hawaii, um, hhhrc.org backslash overdose, and mm-hmm. we will mail you a free naloxone um, overdose prevention kit. That is so awesome. And thank you for um, providing that website as well for anyone else, because I was going to ask, like, if you're not in Hawaii, where can people find it? But I mean, Narcan lit- it saves lives, like literally the amount of stories and like the documentaries I've watched or even on TikTok of people who were dying from an overdose and ha- were saved by Narcan is crazy. Like it's such a life saving drug. And I'm really grateful that it is available in Hawaii, because I know that like there's been a lot of difficulty with some regions and like some states in the yes. U.S. previously of like legalizing it to where people would be able to get access to it because it was pretty difficult in the past. But now are you able to pretty much get it anywhere in the U.S.? You can get it pretty much anywhere in the U.S. And now they're trying to make it actually readily available where you can buy it over the counter. Oh, that's, that's good. That's like on the horizon. And so right now it is through a prescriber. And so our medical director at our office um, prescribes it, uses her licensure to prescribe it. But um yeah, no, they're tr- the 
advocacy movement is happening and we're trying to get it so that people can just buy it over the counter like at your local like CVS or anything like that. That's so awesome. I, I think that's really great. And I, I personally just really believe in Narcan. I think it's something that um, maybe some people may be like, oh, like only first responders need that or only, you know, like firefighters or policemen. In my opinion, if I think as many people as possible should be carrying it. Like I have my one that I bring just in case for anyone. If I see, like if I'm going out to a club or if I'm going to a music event or something, because any club you go to, any bar you go to, any music event you go to, there will be people using some sort of substance. And I would never be able to forgive myself if I was at an event, someone overdosed. And because the paramedics took like five extra minutes to get there, they passed away and there's nothing I could do about it. Like I would never be able to forgive myself. You know, I w just want to be able to have it on me. So in case anything happens with anyone there, random strangers, whoever it may be, cause you never really know, you know, what's going on, what other people are doing. It's so good to have on you. I think it's just such a good resource. And with the, the amount of fentanyl overdoses that are happening, which this is from the data I've seen, so correct me if I'm wrong, but like uh, fentanyl, well, overdoses killed more people 18 to 18 to 25 years old last year, was it last year or the year before, than COVID uh, within that specific yes, age I range. Think I, I think I saw that too. Yeah, mind blowing. Like it's actually <clears throat> crazy how many people are, it, it's like the number one, um, don't quote me on that, but it's there's so many people who are dying and particularly young people. And it's not just, you know, people who are actively using extremely hard substances. Um, it's, it's anyone. So I think being able to carry Narcan um, and being able to have it on you in case anything happens with anyone you know or even strangers you don't know is so, so helpful and definitely valuable. So with um, the Narcan uh, HHRC distributes, um, how, how do you specifically distribute some uh, Narcan to someone who might be overdosing? Um. Like, how do you administer it? Me? Well, I guess I should ask, sorry, to clarify. Um, do you, Would you be able to tell us, like, what kind of the first symptoms of an overdose might be? Like, what to watch for if someone's acting weird or, um, you know, unconscious? What are kind of the symptoms of uh, overdose to look for? Um, unresponsiveness, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, shallowness of breath, like I said, like, it slows mm -hmm. your breathing. Um, mm -hmm. And then kind of, like, gray, pale skin. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the amazing things about Narcan is mm -hmm. that if you were to ever encounter someone and you think they might be overdosing mm -hmm. um, and you were to administer it to ad overdosing on an opioid specifically mm -hmm. and say they were just over maybe they drank too much or something like that and you mm -hmm. administer it to them it won't have any effect on them. It won't have any kind of bad it won't have wow. any side effects it will be benign basically oh my gosh I didn't know so, that that's amazing wow you know, you don't have to worry about like, oh, my God, if I give this, if I administer this to someone, you know, like mm -hmm. I might be hurting them. Like mm -hmm. it has no negative effects. So wow, that's the great that's thing awesome. about Narcan. But yeah. um, I'm not saying that you should be going around and Narcanning everyone that <laughs> yeah. you meet, please you know, don't. like, please don't. <laughs> it's a very expensive drug. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, but, you know, like you don't have to you have that fear. Like mm -hmm. if you were because, you know, like you might be walking in a parking lot and encounter someone. And mm -hmm. if you're not a medical expert, like you won't be able to like identify exactly diagnose like oh this person yeah, is course. overdosing from an opioid you know yeah. like you know you're going to use your best judgment and use your common knowledge but you know like you want to make the best decision possible yeah oh my gosh that's so great i mean even even more props to narcan that's it's why i'm such like a huge fan of it because it's like it's always just so important just like to have it just in case because you never really know and with the amount that overdoses are increasing it's just becoming more and more relevant that you may be in a situation where people are overdosing i know just in the past like few months there's been so many overdoses uh, fentanyl overdoses in hawaii alone um there was even like the fentanyl laced weed i don't know if you saw at the, like, at the prison yeah like weed are you kidding me? It's actually, it's crazy. So it it's becoming more and more relevant, I think, to really carry it. And I think it's amazing that you guys do. And not only do that, but that you partner with first responders, policemen, yes, um, to be able to have it as well. Because I think, obviously, you know, it's important for them to be I think it's also important to note, though, like, there's been a lot of sensationalism as well mm -hmm. in the news around mm -hmm. fentanyl. You know, like, there's that video of that police officer, like, touching a body yes, and, I like, falling on the ground. Yeah. And, like, you can't overdose from just touching up hill you know like yeah. you don't absorb it through your skin that's not how you're good it's not gonna that's not how fentanyl works mm -hmm. but um you know so really using like trusted like 
um, sites like the CDC is something that we always yep. refer to, um, Drug Policy Forum as well, mm -hmm. the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, they also are a great resource for people that um, use substances or are interested in this subject. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that up because that actually is a very important point because there has been a lot of over sensationalism on the news about like if it's just if you know if you're within 10 feet of someone who has had um, you know yeah. fentanyl then you are at risk of like overdosing it, it's it, I think it should be definitely understood and caution should be um, you know had but if someone is overdosing on fentanyl you're, you're not going to similarly overdose on it you shouldn't stay away from someone who's overdosing there was like some risk. crazy stories about people like giving it out and trick-or-treat candy and like yeah there was <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the news outlets like picked it up, even here locally in Hawaii, mm -hmm. you know, like people were picking up those and we were getting like inundated with people that were like, I'm worried about Halloween, my kids candy, like, <laughs> can you get me Narcan? And so yeah, it was, <laughs> seen those too. It was a real crazy time. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I, I have seen that as well where I'm like, okay, who's giving out? their drugs, the kids on Halloween. Wait a second. I don't, I don't know. I think I have some skepticism when it comes to that. So that, that's good to note too, because um, while it is something that is scary, I think it's not something that should, you know, uh, interrupt our ability to help someone else who mm -hmm. maybe, you know, like, uh, is experiencing an overdose or anything like that. Yeah. So um, I wanted to also ask as well. So we talked about, you talked about um, using Narcan um, within both nostrils, the nasal form, which would you say that's the most common form of naloxone? Yes. The other form okay. is um, it's given intermuscular. Oh, okay. And um, we that's the form we used to give out before the nasal form was available. And gotcha. you would literally have to like draw it out with a syringe oh, and then wow. you would have to administer it to someone. Wow. Which... I mean, if someone's overdosing you right in front of you, like, yeah. I don't know if I would have, like, the capacity to sit there and, like, okay, I'm going to pull yeah. it out, and then I'm going to take it, and then yeah, I'm going to, no. like, inject it. Like, I don't know. I, I just don't know if I would have my wits together enough yeah. to do that. So that's yeah. why we're so thankful for, like, being able to give out, the, um, distribute this um, nasal form because it's just so much more user-friendly, and yeah. it just makes it much more it takes the burden a lot off of the person administering it. Yeah. I mean, props to the, um, you know, the technology that has been developed in order to make it available nasally. And I mean, it's, it's just really impacting lives because I've seen some documentaries and videos of first responders saying that, you know, even just like three years ago, they would, you know, be distributing, um, well, they would be administering Narcan like maybe once a week, whereas now it'll be like four or five times a day, you know, just because of the increase in overdoses, that's obviously dependent on where it is. But um, it's, it really is uh, able to do a lot. So that's, that's super cool that the technology has come that far. Um, why would you say it's important? And I kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear it for you. Why do you think it's important for non-drug users or people who may not, you know, personally associate um, with people who uh, m use drugs to have access to Narcan, to be trained on uh, Narcan administration? What are kind of your thoughts on that? Um, there's so many... There my thoughts are like all over the place on this, but like um, there's so many different like ways someone can overdose, you know, like mm -hmm. it's not just street drugs. There's also prescription medications, mm -hmm. you know, kids get into their grandparents like pain meds, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, our senior citizens like may have forgotten a dose or forgotten if they took their medicines, taking it twice. You know, like we see a mm -hmm. lot of there is also cases of that. So it's not just people that are using wow. substances. It's also people that are actually getting prescribed um, opioids for like their actual um, pain man man management. And so we're fine. You never know. So we always recommend that anyone that's picking up any kind of pain medication that has an opioid that you also pick up Narcan at the same time. Um, also, like a pharmacist can also prescribe it for mm -hmm. you as well when you're picking up your medication. So that's really great. Um, but yeah, no. And everyone, I had to have this conversation with my parents, actually, because really? they're like, they're older, they're more conservative than me. And so like, they're yeah. like, oh, I don't know about that. And I was like, no, you don't know. Like you could be walking down the street and mm -hmm. you could encounter someone um, in a parking lot anywhere. And everyone, like you said, everyone, well, everyone deserves to live first yeah. off, you know, yeah. like the, regardless of if they're using substances or not, they're humans and they have a right to live. So if you are able to help them, I wouldn't see why someone wouldn't want to help them. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, everyone knows someone that is affected by overdose and affected by opioids. Mm -hmm. Like in, in this day and age, like everyone knows somebody that's either has a prescription or mm -hmm. has a relative that is using substances, you know, like everyone mm -hmm. knows someone. Yeah. Oh, thank you for talking about that too, because I will say like, 
I try not to read too much into social media comments because that can just be a hellhole of negativity. Mm -hmm. But um, in, you know, posts about um, the opioid epidemic that's currently happening um, or people who, you know, are in active addiction uh, to substance, I do see kind of a sentiment that is out there where it's like, well, if you're using drugs like that, if you're using hard drugs, then that's your fault and you're playing with your life and whatever consequence you get, you know, is coming to you. And I just think that's absolutely ridiculous um, because first of all, like I think everyone deserves life. Um, and so if you, if you don't agree with that, that's, that's, I don't, I don't know what to say to you, but like everyone deserves a chance at life. And again, like what you were saying before, it could be kids getting into prescription medication, older people, like what you were saying before. I know there's like a huge issue around the country with, you know, um, kids first becoming hooked to pills just from getting access to their parents, mm -hmm. you know, medicine covered and stuff like that. So it's, by having that limited view scope, it kind of eliminates the reality of so many more um, people than who you consider only active drug users to be like maybe the people you see on like Skid Row or something. Like it's so much more complicated than that. And even then, I'm the person who's like, those people deserve to live. They deserve a chance at life. Like, you know, everyone should. And I agree with you. I feel like that's why it's so important, important to be educated and um, learn about Narcan. And like what you were saying before, um, a lot of pharmacies actually do carry it. When I was in Colorado a few months ago and when I first started really looking into it, um, I think it's like most Safeways um, and Walgreens, they do um, distribute uh, mm -hmm. Narcan yes. there as well. Like they'll have it for free pickup where you can get prescribed. So it is even available. You don't even necessarily need to go to say like a external organization yeah. like you guys, but you can find it at pharmacies. So make sure you check those out if, if you haven't already. I highly recommend for all the reasons we were saying before. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask um, as well, what um, are kind of your top tips for harm prevent well harm reduction uh, when it comes to drug use? Just the top things you can think of that really help to make a difference for anyone who might be in active addiction or anyone who is not in active addiction and wants to help. Um, I think some of like what we always say is our top tips are never use alone. Like mm -hmm. that is one of the main reasons why people die of overdose is because they're using alone. And this all this all kind of boils down to the same thing, right? Like that stigma and that yeah. shame. Like yep. they don't feel like they can talk to their friends or they can't talk to their family about their substance use. So they might be like hiding it and trying to go do like use their substances by themselves and then mm -hmm. they might overdose, you know, like, mm -hmm. so never use alone is what we always recommend for people. Um, testing your drugs, like fentanyl test strips, um, mm -hmm. other more um, expansive drug testing kits that are available online that can actually, mm -hmm. for different types of substances, um, those are also really great, you know, like knowing, you're never going to know exactly, unless you have some kind of fancy equipment, you're never mm -hmm. going to know exactly what in, what is in the substances you're purchasing, especially mm -hmm. with street drugs, you know. And so just the more knowledge you can give yourself, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and then just using, the, just going slow. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we see a lot of people that overdose um, are people that are either coming out of recovery and they're like oh well before i used to use mm -hmm. this much drugs and mm -hmm. i my, i'm good i'm in it i'm i'm a veteran you know mm -hmm. let me do this and their body may have a, may have changed the drugs may have changed so you know like mm -hmm. things like that can affect you and you might not be able to handle your body might not be able to handle what it used to could have handled 10 years ago yeah and so um you uh, we see a lot of different overdoses that way as well but mm -hmm. I think those are some of like our top tips. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's super helpful to know because um, it is, you know, tricky within this space specifically around harm reduction because uh, when using harder substances, I mean, it, it's, it's not like it's necessarily helping the body, <laughs> say, but um, it's all about, you know, like minimizing harm and um, like what you were saying before, just taking care of the people um, in any way that you can help support them, which I think is really, really admirable. Um, what are kind of, I wanted to ask this as well for anyone who may be concerned that someone in their life is struggling um, with active addiction, um, you know, abusing substances, anything like that. What, what are some of the, top signs to look out for or what can they do to help that person um i think there's a lot of different resources available um you know you, there's not really 
addiction can look so different for so many different people. So there's mm-hmm. not really like, here's a sign, like, yeah. you know, like, you know, like they're <laughs> yeah. doing this or acting like sense. this, you know, so there's not really a way we can say like, these are signs of addiction, you know, yeah. but um, it can look, it really just looks so different for every person. And yeah. then there's people that are using it recreationally and can handle and can mm-hmm. function actively while using. And so um, there's a lot of great resources out there here in Hawaii. There's something called the Hawaii Opioid Initiative. Hmm. Um, so I think it's opioidshawaii.org, I believe is their website. Okay, super um, cool. But there's, um, there's parents and family support group links there. There's where to get Narcan, so it'll link back to us. Mm, cool. um, how to recognize overdose, um, all of these different great things. Um, something else we've done for overdose is we've created like an online training module mm. so any of anyone can go onto our website and can follow like a click by click like this is what overdose looks like this is how you mm. respond these are the steps this is the rescue breathing this is like so it's a self-guided like um overdose um prevention and response training so we offer that you can do that on your own by yourself mm-hmm. anytime and then every Third Thursday of the month, we do an online training with um, oh, cool. here um, via Zoom. That's mm-hmm. open to anyone that can that would like, and then you can join the training, and then at the end you can sign up for to get Lock Zone from us. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, everyone, we'll have it. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll have it linked in the description box below the website so that you can um, get the link to the virtual training as well as the sessions that you do every Thursday. I didn't even know about the sessions. That's so cool that you guys offered you that. It's just amazing to see that the how proactive you guys are in the work that you're doing because um, that's just why I'm most impressed by you. You're really doing the work, getting out there, putting out the messages as much as you guys possibly can, which I think is so necessary when it comes to kind of as complicated and as big as an is- of an issue as this. Um, one kind of additional question, and I know I didn't put this in the question notes, so totally up to you if you want to answer, <laughs> but what steps do you think like we... Um, as as a nation either legally or socially need to make in order to best kind of curb the overdose crisis that we're really experiencing right now it's a big question that's a (laughs) real big loaded question um well there's so many different things there's so there's so many schools of thought Mm -hmm. around this you know like there's some of the most brilliant minds in the country like that are trying to tackle this issue and there's so many different ways that we could do it like um making narcan more readily available across the country is obviously a great way to save people's lives um Mm -hmm. decriminalizing things like fentanyl test strips Mm -hmm. and things like of that nature obviously is a step we're fighting for here in hawaii Um, but in other states there's things like safe injection sites where someone can go and they can actively use their substance with Mm -hmm. a medical professional on site so you know like okay yeah there's things like that happening in more in other parts of the country so that's another train of thought is that if people had a safe place to go to to use their substances and they wouldn't be using alone they'd be doing it with a medical professional on Mm -hmm. site you know so that way they could still live their lives but not have to worry about overdosing or not possibly die yeah wow that's incredible i didn't even know that that was a thing that existed in other states hawaii needs to get on that (laughs) yeah i i agree with you though i think like even um obviously you work within this space but i feel like even within my limited scope of knowledge for like this this topic and everything i feel like there definitely needs to be a better prevalence of medical professionals available at places where things like this can happen. Mm -hmm. So for example, like music festivals, you know, like a lot of music festivals, someone will die because of like an overdose. It's not uncommon. Um, You know, sometimes multiple people, um, different types of like raves or event. I feel like it's good to have like people on site who have Narcan, you know, or who have the resources available to be able to better assist with people who have um, uh, experienced overdose. There's some really great ones like Dance Safe, um, dance safe. Dance Safe. Yeah, yeah. You guys should check out. And so they're really awesome, and they will actually go outside of music festivals on the continent, and they will test your substances for you before you walk in. Yeah, I think that's so cool. But I think what you're doing here is like a really big step in the right direction for battling the opioid crisis. Like having these conversations, you know, normalizing these conversations, normalizing talking about substance use, destigmatizing. You know, like having these conversations with everyday people. I think is just increasing people's knowledge, everyday people's knowledge of opioids, overdose, and substance use issues, I think is definitely 
the first step and mm-hmm. that it's like the easiest step for all of us, you know, like to just have these conversations. Yeah. I mean, thank you. I appreciate that. I think everyone out there should have this conversation with your kids, you know, most importantly, or friends or people in your life. I know that it's like super uncomfortable and it's very <laughs> dark and it's very scary and it does kind of make people like shift in their seat and like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Like, I don't know if I want to talk about this, but that's exactly why we need to be talking about it. Like we were saying before, the shame and the guilt associated with it is why people are dying but just the the more informed I think we are just overall when it comes to this kind of stuff it's not you know it's it's important that we do it because it's the reality of the world that we live in and it doesn't help anyone to just close our eyes and you know close our ears and pretend like it's not happening when it is very much a real reality and I would hate to you know, for anyone out there to not be educated about anyone, uh, any of this, and then have someone they know and love die, you know, because, because they weren't aware. So, I mean, thank you so much for like going into detail and like talking about all of this, because I know this is like such a serious episode. I'm so sorry. Like this is like really heavy stuff, but um, like I said before, it's, it's really important. And I think the work that you guys are doing is absolutely incredible. Like we could do 10, well, 28 episodes <laughs> about all the different types of work you guys do. And I think it's incredible the resources that you're providing with uh, to people who live with HIV, um, trans individuals, as well as like other people. So if you guys are listening, make sure you go check out the website, particularly if you live in Hawaii, um, f- to learn about all the resources that you offer. Um, it's hhrc.org, right? Yes. Okay. Dot org, not dot com. Um, you can find everything there. Thank you for taking the time. Like no, you're so well spoken about all this. I can tell that you've done this like a million <laughs> times. So, so thank you for speaking about this. I really appreciate no, I it. I appreciate you having us and giving us this opportunity to share our story. Of course. Of course. And thank you to everyone who listened. Make sure you subscribe to the Just Position YouTube channel if you haven't already. This has been a production of Cadence 13, a Ramble studio. New episodes out every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Mwah.